Good morning, Southside. Special greeting to anyone visiting with, with us this morning. We are glad to have you come worship our King together. Um, the nursery, do, do we have that code? It didn't work last week. So, oh, look at that. These are what are called, what's the name again? <laughs> QR codes. Um, so if you tried it last week and it didn't work, I'm going to ask you again as we have like, I think I said 100 babies born in the next couple months. It's just they're coming everywhere. So we need help in the nursery. If any of you feel led of God to help in there, just hit that QR code and get the process uh, going and, and help us serve these uh, dear moms and dads during this season. So thank you guys for putting up the code. Uh, happy Father's Day. Um, I have a sweet word from God for your good and help this morning. I've spent many years studying parenting. From the day I had my first one 31 years ago, it took up my heart of what, what a treasure. I have an eternal soul that's going to live forever. God, how do I train this little one and point him to Jesus Christ? And began just praying for wisdom, and I, I join all you other dads that want to do over. Um, how do we train the next generation of fathers in this kind of culture, in this kind of generation? God blew this open for me in a powerful way in my study this week. I throw away every book I ever read, and I'm going to just ask you to learn Philippians 2, 1 through 11, and you're, you're going to be just fine. I pray that he'll use it for his glory and our help to give the baton to the next generation that he is raising up here at Southside to give their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, 1 through 4. <clears throat> Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So let's go to our God and pray. Father, we are grateful that the veil has been torn in two. We thank you for the work of Jesus Christ, and now we have access and we can commune with the living God. Lord, we are grateful, and there's a full gospel that has brought full acceptance and full fellowship with our King. God, we thank you for this. I pray now as we open up this word, Lord, what is before us is pure gold. By your Spirit, would you take these words and help us to comprehend, and may we see Jesus, and may you put us in the right place as we behold him. God, produce humility in the saints of God. God, if there's any who have come in here that have not been saved, that even this morning you would bring them to poverty of spirit before their God and they would cry out to Christ for salvation. God, I pray for the dads. Lord, I pray that you would raise them up to be these kind of men, that they would lead their homes well, that they would not seek to lord it over, but they would enter in with this authority and wash feet and model the Lord Jesus Christ to this home. God, do mighty things in the hearts of the men this morning that lead these kind of homes. God, thank you for this, and we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, Philippians 1 uh, was good to my own heart, and I, I pray it was to yours as well. We called it the fellowship of the gospel, and we saw that what unifies us and brings us together and what we seek with all of our trials, all of life and death, is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now we're going to move on to Philippians 2, chapter 1, and we come to the therefore. Uh, 2, 1, therefore, and this is the connection of all of chapter 1, all that we've been studying uh, the immediate context is really Philippians 1.27, that word only, after looking at all those truths of the gospel, a summary only, conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Li live worthy of this glorious gospel that we have looked at and seen. This gospel is our hope and it's our foundation. 
We're standing firm in it. We're striving together for the faith of the gospel, said Paul. And we're doing it, he said, with fearless unity. He he says, you've been given the gift to believe and the gift to suffer for the name of Christ twice in that passage. You get to suffer for King Jesus. You get to go out and proclaim this gospel and share it. And it's just as much of a gift as to believe in Christ as to suffer for our Christ. We have a fearless unity as we gather together to go into this world and take the gospel and strengthen each other's hands and feet and mouths to go out and speak and suffer for Christ. A community that helps us from the attacks of the enemies of the gospel. It's a grace gift to suffer for the name of Christ. And now Paul will take on another enemy to this unity that we have. In Ephesians, Paul says, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So we have attacks from without on this unity that we have in the the gospel, in Christ. But some of the hardest things that I have faced are the attacks from within. There'll there'll be attacks from without and attacks from within on this unity. And Paul is going to address that in some profound practical teaching. He's going to link it up to the Mount Everest of Christian doctrine in Ephesians 2, 5 through 11, uh, just the whole doctrine of Christ in those short verses, he's just going to lift up and exalt. It's an amazing passage. And I think before we jump in, some of your favorite things are when I make observations of the text and drag out my introduction, so I'm going to do that once again for you this morning, Uh, with, with my prayer being that the fruit of it would be a strength and unity by humble saints genuinely serving one another and regarding one another as more important than your own self. That's a big prayer for this church, but we have a big God, and he can bring this through the power of his gospel and the Holy Spirit. I want to pray one more time. God, we pray that you would unify us so deeply in Christ. And as we are now going to look at the enemies within, I pray that you would subdue them in each and every one of our hearts. God, we are so prone to pride. We are so prone to our own agendas. And God, I pray that this morning you would put an end to them. You would bring a death blow to self. God, that Christ would be put on display and he alone would have center stage in our hearts and in our affections. God, please minister deeply to Southside Bible Church this morning. Let our unity be deep and real and strong for the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So look with me, just a couple observations. Paul starts in verse 1, therefore, and then he has these if clauses. And in verse 2, make my joy complete. And so what I want you to see just in the beginning as we're looking at unity is is unity is not sterile. It's not just kind of a a command, I, I guess we should do this. I want you to see, this is what brings Paul joy. Pastors get more delight when they see their their body unified in the gospel and loving one another. It's make my joy complete as you guys stand firm in this unity. It's joyful. Paul's not commanding you to do something miserable. It's for your blessing and our good. And so it's interesting to me that the self-emptying life is the fullest, most joyful life. The life that will will lose itself is the one that will find it. Those who seek for self seem to never find this joy. I've shepherded it for so long, and I live in my own heart. Try to go find your joy and everybody making much about you, and that's the recipe for misery. It's the recipe to destroy your marriage. You're always one circumstance away from finding it. Tim Keller in his book on marriage he just said, you're, you're always looking for what your spouse can give to you. And agape is when you finally die and just say, I want to give my life for you to bless you, to grow you and strengthen you. And he said, what gets thrown in is joy. Make my joy complete. And so I'm, if, you're, if you're looking for your kids to do that, oh, I'm finally going to get unconditional love from my children. There's a Greek word, morenos. It's moronic. <laughs> you're going to find very quickly that you're, they're not going to love you unconditionally. You're, you're going to be the one loving unconditionally. So this morning, I'm a minister for your joy. I am not after trying to make you miserable. I want you to be joyful, and I want you to make my joy full uh, by your joy being made full 
and the unity of the gospel. Second observation I want you to notice in verse 2. <clears throat> Paul says, be of the same mind, have the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do not merely look out for your own interests. And so as we look at that command, right before it, we have the, the five ifs. Uh, if this, if that. And, and so why? why? Why not just go to the commands of unity? Why does he give us these five ifs? And the answer is just the whole new covenant is based on this ifs. And they're translated since, and we'll look at those in a second. But Paul loves to lavish us with the mercies of God in Christ Jesus, with all these amazing hope-giving realities that are ours in Christ, every spiritual blessing and the basis and the motivation for any command. So before he calls for our unity, he wants to just remind you of all that you have in Christ, what you experience, what is a reality to you as you live into these, now go follow these commands. So the application is if you're a teacher, I pray that you're always a therefore by the mercies of God that we, we teach and we show these great realities that we have in Christ and then comes the imperatives. If, if you're a parent, I pray that your home smells like Mount Zion and not Mount Sinai. I pray that we understand the way Paul is shepherding and teaching here that that is the way our homes are run and that is how our children are instructed. And then thirdly, I pray um, that you you'd apply it to yourself. Uh, what I've seen in my journey is most of you um, don't want to abuse grace, but you're afraid to use grace, um, to, to, to take these truths that are yours and the encouragement and the acceptance and the love that you have in Christ to now go manifest those into the body. And what I've found in my journey is I love the gospel and I love it for you. And when I blow it, I, I still have my little hangover from Catholicism and I like to club myself. Um, use grace. Let it change and transform and let these statements be powerful in your heart. And then the third observation is verses 5 through 11 of Christ uh, who emptied himself for us. It's the foundation stone of this whole argument. And Paul's going to command you to put off selfishness and empty conceit and to regard one another as more important. And, and the way that's going to happen is there's a hinge pin called humility. And the only way you're ever going to move from this selfishness and self-conceit to thinking about others is going to come through this gift of humility. And humility will never come unless it's based on the foundation of Jesus Christ and all that he has done for you. And so we're going to come and we're going to labor in this. And next week, we'll, we'll just park on verses 5 through 11. So let's begin looking at this verse. By way of introduction, humility is pretty much a Christian word only, at least when it's used in a positive sense. It's always been seen in history uh, of the world as a bad word or a weak word. Studying this week when Paul wrote this, the culture of the day is they saw this word only for slaves. Slaves were the humble, lowly ones that had to serve. And then Paul comes in, in the New Testament, it's used almost 200 times, and it's the chief attribute of the Christian. It's the most necessary quality that a believer must have. It's the only way that you will ever go from pride uh, and selfishness to laying down your life to serve other people. To, to wanting their interest and their concerns, it will never come unless you have humility. And so the question that I've been praying through all week, how do you get humility? I see it as such an important question, and it must be answered. Because uh, being a pastor now for almost 35 years, uh, I've seen something clearer than ever, and, and that's when I teach on biblical unity in the church, is everyone shouts amen if they're a believer. I love unity because when I preach it, everybody says, yeah, let's do it. And the first time you feel slighted or not cared for or treated wrongly, you're undone. And your hurt becomes sovereign and the Lord's desire for unity in the body takes a back seat. And it's like, I love unity till you hurt me. <laughs> then that's sovereign in my life. 
The vows that you took on an altar to live as one flesh, you mean it until you're hurt or slighted. And so my question is this morning, is there a real answer to fix this? I don't want a Sunday school answer. It's Philippians 2, 1 through 4, just pie in the sky theology that we talk about and no one ever lives it. Can any of us ever walk this way? Well, Jesus did. And the answer I want you to hear this morning is a big yes. But if we're ever going to get there, we have to first understand the disease and what that is clearly. And we're going to look at that. And then we got to understand the cure. And then we got to take the prescription every day if we're ever going to walk in humility. So here's your outline for this morning. Paul's going to give us four necessary elements to having gospel-worthy unity. He's going to give us a prerequisite, the pursuit, the poisons to it, and then the great provision that he's given in Christ. <clears throat> and I want to remind you of one thing as we take this up. The, the church in Philippi was an excellent church, probably the most commended church that we see in the New Testament. They had helped Paul greatly on their missionary journeys. Uh, but my guess is that their domestic affairs were not as spotless as their foreign affairs. It appears that there's some personal strife in the body in chapter 4, verse 2, and then the, the poor two ladies that get called out that aren't living in harmony. And so it's possible that they're getting on each other's nerves, exaggerating one another's weaknesses, minimizing each other's virtues, taking up offenses, disputes, growing dissension. The best church will be sure to have this. And this is where the enemy will attack, I tell you right now, as a gospel-centered church. A gospel-centered church will experience the enemy's uh, ire. He will strike hard, and when, when we become more gospel-centered, put on your seatbelts, it's coming. Any steps in that direction will be countered hard and heavy. So I want us to come as we seek to be a gospel-centered church. Let's go and look at the prerequisite for unity. Look with me in verse 1. <clears throat> if, and this is a crucial to the interpretation. There are certain things in the Greek are called like first-class conditions, second, third, and one condition is if, the con and you assume that the condition is not true, but will assume for the sake of argument. The example would be, if Christ was not raised from the dead, then we're among all men most to be pitied. But then there's what's called a first-class condition, which I believe is what is before us. And the if is, as, as indeed is the case, if, and it certainly is true. So a better translation is the word since. And so every one of these will look at them as since. And so let's begin. Paul says, since there is encouragement in Christ. Paraclesis, to call to oneself for consolation and for comfort. Is there any consolation and comfort in Christ since there is? Remember the day that you saw your sin and you're standing before God and where you were, how wrecked you were, how undone you were, and then you saw the balm of Christ, the comfort and the consolation when you saw the Savior, all that we have now that we've been joined to Jesus the sweetness that we have found in Christ should sweeten our spirits. And his tender mercies, he's a sympathetic high priest. What joy there is in Christ since you've tasted, oh, what we have, the encouragement in Christ. David Livingstone was a missionary in Africa in 1873, and he said, nothing earthly will make me give up my work in despair. I encourage myself and the Lord my God, and I go forward. Since I have such encouragement in Christ, I gather and I continue to serve. What encouragements we have in Christ. If there is any of this, if there is, then Paul says, make my joy complete. Unity in the fount of every blessing. That's why the Lord's table is so powerful, because we unify and we, we remember, and we have so much encouragement in Christ. Bonds us. Second, if there's any consolation of love and is indeed the case, any encouragement that you have from the love of Christ, the love that we have from our God in this gospel, to know that in Christ, God loves me this morning as I stand here. It's key that it's a perfect love, eternal, it's active, it's unconditional. 
Uh, it, it, it's immutable. It will not change. Uh, we bathe in that. That comfort that we receive from the love of God in Christ Jesus unifies us. John wrote this in 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this is the love of God was manifested in us that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, and he did, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Since there is such consolation of love, let us unify. Let us make Paul's joy complete in our unity. Thirdly, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, this is that word koinonia. You'll remember it back in Philippians 1 that we have this koinonia together in the gospel. And now we have this koinonia uh, as we're indwelt by the Spirit of God. He brings us fellowship, union, and communion with Jesus Christ. And so we have literally koinonia with Jesus Christ through His Spirit. The new covenant, God says, you'll not have to teach one another to know me for all will know me. His spirit dwells in us and we have fellowship with God. John wrote it well in 1 John 1. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. So John's saying what Paul says. And this is the message that we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So since we have koinonia with the spirit of God and therefore with one another, uh, make my joy complete as we stand in unity. And fourth and fifth, if there's any affection and any compassion. Affection is these inward our, uh, bowels, our, our inward affection and compassion that draws out sympathy and mercy. I live in those with Jesus Christ. What a sympathetic high priest that we have, brothers and sisters. Believer, have you not tasted his tender mercies and his tender compassion? Then make my joy complete. We see throughout the Gospels, Christ, his compassion on the sick, the lost, the dying, Jesus wept. His tender mercies have been my pillow in this journey. They're new every morning, and I love getting older because I'm slowing down and I'm disappreciating the mercies and compassions of God all the more. So I just want you to hear these ifs. There are those who know the nearness of God. And because we've been saved and we, we know Christ, and we know this intimacy and this fellowship, we, we have unity. And so a first-class condition is, is it's a reality. And the third class is assumed true for the sake of argument, though it's not really the case. So I would ask you, do you have a first-class condition or a third class this morning? Uh, it's just assumed true for the sake of argument, but it's not really the case that you come in here and you know not Jesus Christ and you don't know this fellowship, and therefore you're a unity disruptor, and you just break down relationships because you don't have this reality of Christ and the oneness and the joy in him. So the prerequisite to unity is that you've tasted these things of the gospel. Therefore, secondly, we're going to look at the pursuit then of unity in verse 2. So make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. So make my joy complete, it means to fill up to the brim and, and do it by, by, by these four attitudes. And if I had to just paraphrase them rather than just working through each one is since you've tasted the sweetness of being saved and joined to Christ, you've gone from enmity to love with God. 
enjoy all the sweetness that comes from this reality, and then love the brethren with the natural outworking of God's inworking. Make the realities of this gospel living water to where I drink and I thirst no more so that it will flow out to others, that will give streams of mercy to others. So be intent on one purpose. Well, what is that? Let me just go back to Philippians 1, 5. What was that purpose? Well, in view of your koinonia in the gospel from the first day until now, verse 7, that you're partakers of grace with me. Verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. I just want that, that name of Christ lifted up. Verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy in the faith. Verse 27, conduct yourselves then in a manner worthy of the gospel. Be intent on this one purpose, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that we are joining hands and we're deepening in it and we're spreading it. Stay in there. One purpose, have one mind, one spirit, one heart and soul with respect to the gospel. The urgency of setting it forth. We're all gospel-oriented. We're gospel-minded. Our joy is wrapped up in the progress of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't want these glad tidings or good things to sit and rot. Like-minded that Christ must be exalted in our bodies, whether by life or death. Be of the same mind. Think this way. Be one-minded, like-minded together in this. Secondly, maintain the same love. Faith knits us to Christ. Love knits us to one another. Colossians 3.12, And so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Love is the grace that holds all the other graces together. And be united in spirit. In the Greek, that's one souled. Be one souled, body of Christ, in intimacy. That's what Paul says uh, is conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, is that we unite on this. And here's what I've been excited about for Father's Day. I, I feel bad I forgot it was Father's Day during the week. And when I hit this point, I was like, man, that'd be great for dads, and it clicked. And so this is your gift, because I love you dads and dads-to-be, the poison, the poison to unity. This is what will kill this unity, and I don't want any wives elbowing husbands during this time, okay? <clears throat> no kids rolling your eyes. I had my son, he said at a wedding yesterday, he's, they asked him about something about being my son, and he said, when he steps down from ministry, I'll, I'll tell you a little more about him. So <clears throat> that was kind. Uh, so this is what's going to kill unity. We must see it as a poison, and I want you to see it as a poison because this is dangerous to the bride of Christ. It's dangerous to our own souls. This must be drained out by the work of Jesus Christ in verses 5 through 11. This poison can only be sucked out of your veins by the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at it. First, it's verse 3, the haughtiness. Uh, do nothing then from selfishness or empty conceit. <clears throat> selfishness is the same word used in Philippians 1.17. You'll remember they were, they were uh, trying to cause Paul trouble, trouble by a spirit of rivalry and jealousy. It was the root word for a hireling, one who, who just works for pay, and when things got hard, they would flee because they, they weren't true shepherds. They were about self-promotion, and it's a spirit of rivalry. You don't, I, I heard this quote, you don't fight to live, you live to fight. James 3.16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder in every evil thing. Does that summarize your life, disorder? Like, I can't believe how bad everybody in this world is. Everywhere you go, there's disorder and brokenness and anger and quarreling. You know what that means? Put a saddle on. <laughs> it's you. And that's what we want to look at is what am I producing? And this is the, the whole key. So wake up right here, guys. Empty conceit. This, this one set me free. I was listening to a preacher that just clicked. 
Uh, it's an interesting word. The root word is doxa. What do you think we get from that? Doxology, doxius, glory, glory. And the, and the word on the front, kina, it means to empty oneself. And, and, and so the word means to be glory empty. You're, you're glory empty. You're, you're hungry for honor, respect, praise, applause. It's, it's just a person starved for glory. It's a deep, deep insecurity that fills the human race. And what you're struggling with because of the fall, you were made in God's image. You had weight. You had glory when God was at the center and you loved him and served him. And when the fall came, these image bearers, we lost weightiness. We don't have glory. And now we're glory starved. And your fear this morning that I don't really matter, that I just, I don't count. It's deep within the human soul now because of the fall. It just, everyone's image is everything because you're afraid you're nothing. And you're just, all you can think about is yourself. And last week, you, you would rather be attacked by your enemies than to be ignored. Than to, to be treated as if you're of no importance. The greatest fear is to be forgotten, passed over, dismissed, ignored, the, the, the phrase in our day and age, marginalized. This has caused wars. It's, it's just this spirit has destroyed the human race. We were made for glory. We were made to matter, to last forever, to be blessed of God, to be loved by others and to love others. We were made to be eternal, not to fade and decay and deteriorate. We were made to last and we know it, to have weight and glory as image bearers of God. And we all sit here knowing that we're decaying. And if you don't, it's coming. <laughs> we fear that we don't really matter. We spend our days trying to prove that we do. I'm going to show the world. I'm going to show my husband. I'm going to show my parents. I'm going to show my boss that we matter. We really do. We're worthwhile. We have weight. We hunger for glory. We're, we're empty, hunger, glory seekers. That's what this is, this word. And what it does is for all have sinned and lack the glory of God. All sin comes from us not putting God where he belongs and trying to give ourselves glory and praise and honor. And trying to be God. And what it does is it leaves us empty and broken on the inside. And now we go around bluffing. We, you ever watch the guys at Swag? You know why? Because they think they're nothing. We use people for how they can make me feel needed. I'll serve people so I feel necessary and counted. We spend our days trying to manufacture getting love, getting praise and glory. We're starved for it. That's what this word is telling us. So what happens if someone treats us as small, doesn't validate us, doesn't treat us as weighty? What's going to happen to this person? You're going to be undone. You're going to be undone and again, this is where wars and rumors of wars throughout our history have come from. This is where bigotry comes from. This is where relationship breakdowns happen. This is where divisions in the body of Christ break in, despite what we know about God and what he desires for us. It's killing us. The bottom line is we feel small and we want to prove that we're somebody. And we bring that right into the church. In fact, the smaller we feel, the more hurt when someone treats us this way, whether it's real or perceived. And we call it a low self-image, and it's really a high self-image. We simply can't stop this in our own power, our own ability. There is nothing that can change this but the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can spend all of your days trying to consider other people's interests more than yours, and you will never get there. That's why the history of the world is a history of conflicts and wars and feuds. We need a remedy from our self-centeredness to God-centeredness, to others-oriented. We have to have a remedy for this. Verse 4, we need a remedy to not look out merely for our own interests, 
looking out for our interests alone. The focus of me. We come into the world, my life, my needs, my rights, my aims, my opinion is all that matters, my glory. And all of my life is just wrapped around me, 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 me. You can't serve others coming into that world without using them to get something. With this mindset, you will serve for your glory. And these poisons all flow out of pride. And they kill the unity of the body of Christ. And maybe they're killing your own home as you sit here this morning. And this is our problem. We're glory-starved, hunger-mongers to want to have weight and to want to matter. And I came here not to discourage you, but you have to know the, the problem if you're ever going to get to the cure. And so I hope you're stuck this morning right now. How do I get out of this? I'm going to give you the provision. I'm going to give you the cure, and it's so beautiful. In verse 3, if you'll look with me, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but this, but Allah, it's a strong adversative in the Greek. Um, don't do it out of selfishness and empty conceit, vain glory, but on the complete opposite with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Don't look out for your own interests, but the interests of others. And so the key here is humility. The, the way we move from selfish ambition and vainglory to regarding one another as more important than ourselves, to not merely looking out for our own interests, but for the interest of others, and even to being a good dad. To be a good dad, how do I get there? It's going to come through humility. And Jesus stood up on that Sermon on the Mount, and he says, you want to enter into my kingdom? You enter in poor in spirit. You come stripped naked like a beggar, just say, my only hope is alms for the poor. God, have mercy on me, the sinner. I have nothing. I have no boasts. I'm a sinner. I can't change it. I have no righteousness. It's a filthy rag. My only hope is Jesus Christ. And he says, those are the ones who come into my kingdom not by all your works and fancy stuff and being the best version of you. You don't enter in that way. You come in empty by the bootstraps. Just they're broken. You come in the narrow way and you walk the narrow way of humility until you see Jesus. The kingdom of God begins in humility and it flows in humility. And I'll tell you, it's going to end glorifying in humility. So we need something to cure our vainglory. Our glory seeking, our wanting to matter, our wanting to be made much of. And the remedy this morning for your soul is humility. But my question is, isn't that the problem? We feel like nothing. And we know we were made to be something as image bearers of God, so we're grasping at it. And the way to fix it, you're saying, is to be nothing? Forget what you were made to be by God? Just embrace that you're nothing? No, <laughs> that's not the answer. The more I've been thinking about it, it's that we understand what humility is. And I've talked about this so much, but I'm going to do it again. <clears throat> I can't remember who it was, but he said this. Humility is not that I'm just bad, worthless, or nothing. And it's not just walking around with an Eeyore complex. It's not to, to think less of yourself, he said, but humility is to think about yourself less. Selfishness and vainglory are preoccupied with self. And since the fall, we come into the world bent inward, looking at self. And now go to someone like that and say, think about others more than yourself. And it's impossible. You can't do it. You need something from outside of you to fix this horrible problem, what sin has done to us image bearers. And you need something from within you to change your nature that is so preoccupied with self and everything is, is locked into it. You need a new mindset and you need a new heart. And I want you to get this. This is for free. I want you to avoid a lifetime of doing what I did. I spent so much time, I'm going to work on pride. <laughs> I, I'm going to kill pride. And you, you know what? You started wrong right there. What if you actually get some growth in it? Wow, I'm not prideful because of how hard I worked on it. That's not going to work. 
So just please hear this. If, I, if you've ever heard anything from Pastor Murphy, looking at yourself will not bring what Paul is calling for here of humility of mind, I promise you. So what will, Pastor? Look at verse five. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Humility, I believe, is what you're looking at. It's what you're looking at. Are you spending all your days looking at yourself or are you looking at Christ, fixing your eyes on him, the author and perfecter of faith? The only way I'll ever become humble is staring my eyes out at Jesus Christ, not by staring at me trying to work at it. I look at the one who emptied himself and took on the form of a, of a man. How do I think less about myself? How do I quit hungering for my glory? You want weight. You want glory. Well, let's look at the one who had it. The one who had all glory. The Son of God worshipped all glorious in glory and in heaven. And he, he, he emptied himself of it. Willfully, he, he emptied himself of the glory that you're trying to get. And he, he emptied it, and he emptied it so much that the infinite took on finite. And he didn't just take it on. He, he gets born into a manger, a donkey's dish. And then he goes so low that he goes to the most shameful death that you could ever have hanging on a cross, the only one who is perfect and being ridiculed and mocked and scorned and crucified in your place. There's no lower descent than where Jesus Christ went who had all glory. He became obedient to the point of death. The glory that you're seeking, the one who is glorious within and without, he gave it up. He emptied himself. He went as low as anyone could possibly go and he washed dirty disciples' feet. He came into this world to serve you. I didn't come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom to many. Look at me. I came in here to save you from wrath and make you pure. And now what Jesus did by way of atonement, he sits in ultimate glory now at the right hand of God. And he can save you this morning from yourself and your sin and from the wrath of God. Jesus prays in John 17, Father, I want them to have the glory that I shared with you before the foundation of the world. I want them to have glory. I want them to matter and have weight again by having God at the center of their lives. I want you to have that. And I want you to hear this. You are now by the gospel brought into the Trinity and you stand blameless with great joy this morning. You have weight, child of God. You want to matter? You want to have weight? You are a child of the living God. You're in the inner circle of the Trinity. You are loved by God eternally and forever. You matter because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you want to hear something sweet is now someone can snub you and treat you as small, nothing or worthless, and you can respond in love. You can enjoy all the blessings in Christ and be humble and think about Christ and others and not spend all your days thinking about yourself. This is called being born again. You can be born again from self-seeking glory to the God-honoring glory for the rest of your days. William Wilberforce, who did some mighty work for slavery in Europe, one, one day a lady said, how is your soul faring in the midst of all your labors? And he said, madam, I forgot that I had a soul. How are you doing? I don't know. I've been so lost in serving other people I haven't thought about myself. You ever hear that? Jesus was treated the way we deserve to be treated so that we can be treated the way that he deserves. And now praise be to God that as you look at this Christ, you can quit thinking about yourself all day long. That's the blessed freedom of the children of God. And as you look at Jesus, you're humbled 
because it's all about him. It's, I've got something better to look at than Ken Murphy. Look at Christ. Stare your eyes out. Look at all of his fullness. And you can lay your life down for others with joy and washing feet and serving. In the Spirit, all of us looking to Jesus Christ as a body will have real, true, worked out unity for all the world to see. The church is broken by unbroken people. And so I pray that humility would be the air that we breathe here at Southside because we look our eyes out at Jesus Christ. And that's what takes up my heart. And now I have weight and I can be mistreated and snubbed and I can be offended. And it just isn't the end of my life because I am loved and accepted by Jesus Christ. Do you realize what that would do in a body and what that would put on display if we all got this? To God be the glory. And I'll close out. Dads, here it is. You want to be a good dad. If you think you're King Tut and you're home, man, you've missed it. You come in now and you can, if you're still a glory seeker, you're still trying to find it through your occupation so that you can become the top, top in your class. Even in church, that I can look like the best dad because all my kids look perfect. And all you're about is glory and your own stuff. You'll, you stay up all night just videoing and looking at things you shouldn't. You're still just wanting glory. You're wanting the praise from someone who's not your wife. You're, you're, you're lost and all the wrong things. You're a glory monger, and you'll, you'll be a flop as a pop until that gets fixed. I promise you, that's what's wrong in your home. And the one who finally gets this and sees Jesus for all that he is, and now I'm not trying to get weight out of life. I have it as a child of God, and I can now give my life away to my children, to my spouse, to my church, to my neighbors. I am free to serve Jesus Christ and not just look out for my own interests, but the interests of others. The freedom that this will bring to you, dads, I cannot believe. And, and if it doesn't, you're just going to be a miserable dad all the time because it, no one's making much of you in your home. And it's just one day a year, someone gives you a card that says, thank you, dad. That's not scratching my itch. And I'm telling you, what you're looking for is to be set free from being a glory monger and wanting it to all be about you. And so there is a freedom to die and serve your family with joy. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind and heart. So dads, I, I pray that this is what you would become in your homes by the grace of God. And this is what you'd be in the church of God. Let's pray. Father, we need to die to self-glory. We need to quit wanting to matter. It's tricky. It can come through um, trying to get uh, advances at work, or it could come by trying to look spiritual at church. God, there's so many ways that we try to get glory. And the way we'll know is when someone treats us small. God, what does that do to our hearts? What does it do to us pastors? why we do this. God, I don't matter. I pray we just die. And all that matters is we look at the Lord Jesus Christ and we want to help people matter, <laughs> to enter into glory, to, to see Christ and become children of God. Lord, we want them to, to lose their lives from trying to, to make it about them to finding the joy of making it about you. God, help us all to lay our lives down to bring as many in from self-worshippers to worship the living God. And I pray for any in here this morning who are dying from trying to make much of themselves. They're sad, they're depressed, they're discouraged because really no one in this world will love them the way they feel they deserve. And what they've been looking for is the love of God in Christ Jesus. He sent his son into a world to die on a cross 
for all of their self-centeredness and selfishness, valuing everything in this world more than the living God. Oh, what sin. What sin to treat God that way. God, even now in the quietness of their hearts, let them look to the freedom that comes in Christ Jesus, the forgiveness of sins, the changing of a heart now that wants your glory and your glory alone and all the joy that will flow from that. God, draw people to yourself this morning and let them call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be healed and saved and reconciled to God. Lord, I pray for our dads. Lord, let this message set them free. Let them have the attitude, the mind of Christ. Help them to empty themselves and to take on the form of a bondservant and enter into their homes, to love their wives and to love their children well. God, set them free from vainglory, wrong pursuits and the things that they're looking for. Give them the freedom to love. God, do this mighty work in our hearts. We need you deeply. Let humility be the aroma of this church. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.